All right, so welcome again to another lovely edition of Cataloging Month. Today we're going to be talking about subject headings. Let me share up my presentation. All right, so um, I'm Lauren Kelly. I'm the Technical Services Consultant here at the Department of Libraries. Um, that's not one. Um, today we're going to be talking about subject headings. And we're going to go through some examples of controlled vocabulary and we'll kind of get into what controlled vocabulary means. We'll talk about different thesauri. Um, we will talk about some of the common ones today, although there are plenty and later in the presentation we'll talk about some alternatives and some new ones that have come up that have been relevant. Um, we'll go over the important mark fields. We'll then kind of talk about a macro history lesson um, with some of the discontents because there have been very interesting people involved, different events have happened and there have been different movements from you know the 70s to you know, last month even. So we'll look at some of those examples and um, hopefully discussion will happen. Um, if something comes into your head, if there's a question, please um, feel free to turn on your microphone or put it in the chat, um, which I'll check periodically and try to read aloud if that's not showing up for you. Um, just feel free to jump in if need be. All right, so. When it comes to controlled vocabulary, um, really the basis of it is to be specific, to get rid of inconsistencies, and to um, account for synonyms. So an example here, when we think of the word pen, there could be you know, a pig pen or a writing implement pen. Um, and so this is, an, this is an example. If you have a subject heading that is pen, it may mean multiple things. So if we go to controlled vocabulary over here, these are examples of the Library of Congress subject headings. Um, you can see that if we're talking about a pig pen, it's really swine housing, which variant terms that are covered by this heading, hog houses, pig pens, piggeries, pig pens, pig styes, swine houses and equipment. So there's a lot that's covered by that one term, but that's the point of controlled vocabulary. Um, and down here we see pens, writing materials and instruments is also another subject heading that could encapsulate what kind of pen you're talking about. Um, so there's not discrepancies. So that's really the point of controlled vocabulary. It's agreed upon terms that kind of get at the heart of um, a topic, a subject, um, a concept, and how it should be phrased so that you can be specific and consistent. So those are kind of some of the, the pros, the consistency, um, the ability to, you know, have kind of an expanding vocabulary um, is helpful. There is room for expansion in something like the Library of Congress subject headings, which we'll get into that more a little bit. And it really is so that retrieval can be accurate and um, you can get the same thing every time, as well as within your catalog, you can search one specific topic and it'll pull everything up with that same, um, with that same phrase, with that same controlled vocabulary. Now, there's also cons to this because, you know, how precise do you want to be? Precision can have its pitfalls where, you know, language needs to be known in order to um, pull up specific things. And if that language is outdated, which we'll get into, um, or problematic in some way, or just not representative, um, or you know, has changed meaning over time, um, that precision can then hurt us when it comes to controlled vocabulary. And then also bias, you know, who's choosing the words, how are they coming to those words? Um, and 
what bias may be reflected in that system. There's a good quote from Emily Drabinsky, and in the syllabus, um, I think I've linked potentially more than one of uh, her writings on this topic and critical cataloging, which we'll get to. Um, and Emily Drabinsky says that, you know, subject headings seek to contain not only the present sum of human knowledge, but also to encompass any new knowledge generated in the future. So you kind of have to think about, okay, what's going to be relevant 20 years from now when someone does a search? That's a big component um, that comes into controlled vocabulary and what terms we use. So when it comes to the application of subject headings, there are some helpful hints of where to look, where to gain kind of a basis, um, especially if you're if you're kind of on a, a time constraint, which we often are when cataloging, you know, you get a huge sip, shipment of books in um, and you want to get them out on the shelf or get those holds to people who have been waiting ever so patiently. Um, so a good place to check for subject headings is on the Verso or the cataloging in publication page. Oftentimes um, they will include both Library of Congress mm -hmm. terms and also um, the BISATCH, I think is how I was gonna pronounce that acronym, um, but we'll get into what that means as well. Um, but usually three or four topics, um, subject headings are included in that publication data um, on the reverse side of the title page, that first so page. You can also, you know, read the back of a book, read the summary to get a better sense of what um, subjects may apply. And of course, choosing subject headings um, with time, you get more efficient, a little bit better about um, being able to apply with you know, more certainty, more accuracy, um, and that comes with time being able to check all these different places and being able to know where to look is kind of a, a big part of the battle. So you can also check the table of contents or the chapter titles. Um, that's especially helpful with nonfiction, I think. Um, and also the index, especially in nonfiction, um, terms that apply multiple times. You can kind of see the ratio of a topic appearing in a in a material if you're looking for different um, subject headings to apply to a certain item. And then there are also places to compare, um, which if a lot of times with fiction, um, I will have gone on to Goodreads and gone over to the like user generated tags. Those can be extremely helpful as a starting point to figure out what subject headings apply to specific materials. And then also in OCLC Classify, which is a great website, um, it's experimental, but it'll show you what Dewey numbers people have assigned at uh, different libraries, and it'll show you what institutions. It'll show you the percent of, you know, if there if there's an item that sometimes is, you know, in 521 versus 518 or whatever. I made those numbers up. Um, it'll show you the breakdown of where it's more commonly found, but it also has subject headings, and I believe those are also the the BISATCH, um, which we'll get into that controlled vocabulary, but that's also a really good place to look. And a lot of times, if there's a term that shows up in one controlled vocabulary, um, there will be either a similar or an equivalent term, and that gives you a nice place um, to start as a, as a launching pad into a further investigation of, okay, what applies here? Marie has put into the chat, um, that a helpful source. I'll also look for the material on WorldCat and see what other libraries have used. Yes, that is a fantastic use of WorldCat, um, which I don't think I really go into WorldCat in today's presentation, um, but I'm always happy to answer questions about WorldCat. Um, you know, primarily we use it for downloading records, but it's also really a great reference resource where you can compare what other um, libraries have done in records. And yeah, that's a great place to look for subject headings. All right, so I've mentioned Library of Congress subject headings already, and 
this is the controlled vocabulary that was created by the Library of Congress. Um, you know, it kind of came into formation over a period of time, 1909 to 1914. Um, and the definition here, authority records enable librarians to provide uniform access to materials in library catalogs and to provide clear identification of authors and subject headings. So these subject headings um, and also like name authorities, it's all in one database. Um, so it's kind of a, a lot in one area, which is great. Um, and over 12,008. 12,800 public and academic libraries use these. So it's, you know, really common um, and it is free. So those are kind of the big selling points of the Library of Congress subject headings. We will get into specifically, um, I'm not going to say pushback, but um, some discontents around the Library of Congress subject headings because these are very much alive. Um, not set in stone, not static, which is important. And there's a lot of work um, around changing the Library of Congress subject headings. So they do have a way to submit proposals for changing, updating, adding um, proposals to add or revise the headings. They go through a lengthy review review process. Um, there is documentation required, which includes the definition of the term, its variations in reference sources. Um, they call it uh, a literary warrant, warrant where um, you basically provide a bibliography of this term is present in these materials, um, which I think is really like an interesting kind of flow of, OK, the terms are not changed just because, you know, in theory we're thinking about them, but no, look, there are specific books that would warrant this as a subject heading, and that can be used to get subject headings put into the controlled vocabulary. Um, there's a series of public comments that occur, um, and then Library of Congress staff will either approve, reject, or send the proposal back for revision. Most of the time proposals are accepted, so that's a good thing, but it is a lengthy process. Um, and because of that, in the 90s, um, the Subject Authority Cooperative Program, SACO, was created, um, specifically trained catalogers outside of the Library of Congress, um, kind of banded together and worked to you know, better the headings, create new ones, but they work on proposals. So it's more collaborative um, because a lot of work go into these proposals. As I said, you know, you got to do research about um, how it's used, when it's used, um, and really provide a lot of justification for things to change. Um, and so these funnels um, have now been created. So you'll hear the term SACO funnel if this is an interest of yours. Um, and basically it is a cooperative group of librarians, catalogers who um, create proposals, but on specific topics in, in there's um, a medical term SACO funnel. There is an LGBTQ plus SACO funnel. There's an African-American SACO funnel um, and they, and they, you know, stay in those kind of categories of experience or identity um, and ensure that the headings that are present and um, uh, add any updates, but they work on proposals together. And I think that's a, a really great um, process and it definitely lessens the burden of um, making controlled vocabulary better and getting changes to occur. Um, there's a good blog here uh, at the end of this slide and throughout the slide um, there are plenty of links and I think most of them are also on the syllabus which those will all be on Niche Academy. So I've said BISOC a couple of times um, that is the book industry standards and communication subject headings slash codes list. Um, it was created by the book industry study group in 1995. It's an industry approved list of subject descriptors, each of which is represented by a nine character alphanumeric code. 
So I have an example here, um, travel for the general south of the United States. Um, we have this code here, TRV025070, and then what would appear in the record is um, in quotations there, travel slash United States slash South slash general. These, um, these codes and these subject headings are used typically in, in bookshops by booksellers and publishers. That's why um, it often shows up in that publication data and also libraries. Unfortunately, there is a barrier to this in that um, the manuals and whatnot, there is a fee for those. Um, and I don't know what the exact um, updating process or you know, change proposals requires for this, um, but there are more examples here. So here we have some historical fiction on the left um, and some nonfiction on the right. So you can see um, in, in here we have the code that associates with the actual heading. Um, here we have the 650 fields that reflect um, these headings. Another very um, popular controlled vocabulary is the FAST headings, um, faceted application of subject terminology, which these are the terms that are um, included in OCLC, not OCLC, um, the classify website. Um, I think I said it was BISOC, but I'm pretty sure it's FAST. So, um, these terms came from a collaboration of OCLC um, and Library of Congress. FAST subjects were developed by adapting the Library of Congress subject headings with a simplified syntax retaining the very rich vocabulary while also making the schema easier to understand, control, apply, and use. And that came out um, in 1998. There are over 1.7 million authority records. A lot of terms, but there's a lot of concepts out there. The good thing about this is that it is free. Um, there is an online guide to using these, um, and they have a pretty good database, Search Fast, um, and it will show you the heading, but it'll also show you examples. It'll show you, um, you know, the usage which is really cool to see. Um, and it'll show you references as well. And they give, um, yeah, here's here's an example here of from the MARC record. This is kind of what it looks like in Verso. Um, and we'll get more into uh, the layout of the MARC record in just a minute once we look at another controlled vocabulary. The Sears list of subject headings. This was created by Minnie er Earl Sears in 1923. Um, you'll see these used in small and medium sized libraries. It is only by being flexible and expandable that Sears list has been able to over the years fill the needs of a wide variety of libraries around the world. So. Um, you know, that theme of flexibility and uh, whether or not it can be expanded has come up already multiple times. And these subject headings, um, you interact with them in a thesaurus-like volume, which can be pretty pricey. Once again, um, the resources that, you know, you have to pay for could present a barrier to use. Um, Here's the, the cover of the 23rd edition, which is what they're currently on. Uh, and here's what it looks like on the inside uh, for technical services. You get um, kind of the scope of the term, uh, different related terms, and then different um, examples that are you know, related, similar, but their own subject headings in bold. So library technicians as well as library technical processes um, can be used for material on that. Here's an example of the Sears terms for nonfiction. Once again, this is how it appears in Verso. Um, yeah. 
So you may have noticed that um, with some of these examples, I'll flip back for a minute, there's a two subfield in the 650 field that notates what the controlled vocabulary is. Um, FST for fast. Two here, BISAC. BISAC, SH, subject headings. Um, so built into the field in the indicator, in the, really in the second indicator um, spot, there is the ability to say what controlled vocabulary your term comes from. Zero is, as we went over, very common. Um, you know, if you see a zero, the term is from the Library of Congress subject heading, and you don't need a subfield two. You can just add the A subfield for your term as it's stated in that um, in that controlled vocabulary and any subject subdivision portions if you want, um, if for fiction, if for a specific year, if for um, a geographic location. Or in the second indicator field, there is a seven. And that is just stating, look to subfield two, and you'll find out what controlled vocabulary uh, this term is coming from. So here we have that, you know, basically written out. Um, if it's zero, zero, you'll have the Library of Congress subject heading term there in subfield A. Um, similarly, if there's a seven, you'll have the term, but you'll have this added subfield two. And for a good record, we're really looking for three subject headings. Um, that's, you know, kind of the minimal amount of work that we want to um, ensure that uh, is in a record for findability, really. Um, yeah, and down here is the Mark 21 handbook, which if you've joined me for other um, sessions this month, I have been harping on the Mark 21 handbook because it really is most helpful. It has examples, um, which is always good to see. So here are some examples. Um, I think I pulled this one from the from the Mark 21 handbook, but we have our main term and there is a zero here. So we know that this is a Library of Congress um, subject heading rain and rainfall. Our subfield Z states that this is pertaining to rain and rainfall in Washington state. We have another, um, and it goes from larger to smaller. So Seattle is the specific area of the Washington state that is showing rain and rainfall in the way of it being a map. V is for um, that form or, or not really genre, but form I think is the terminology. Um, so this right here, it's a map of Seattle, which is in Washington state, and it's of the rain and rainfall, which is a Library of Congress subject heading. Down here in our Verso record, once again, we have Library of Congress subject headings. You'll notice there's no subfield two. Um, there is a V for fiction, and it's paleontologists. And, you know, the part of the Part of the trouble of applying subject headings is how many um, subdivisions or subfields do you want within one subject heading? Um, how specific do you want to be? Do you want to say it's in Seattle, uh, Washington versus just having Washington State? You know, uh, you have to make that decision. How many? how many subfields you want to add, how specific you want to be, especially when you could have as many subfield Zs as you would like. Um, when it comes to 690, this is the local subject access fields, which um, can be helpful if there are you know, important terms that aren't represented, but are clear and true you have good authority to add them. Um, you can use these 690 to 699 fields. They're reserved for local subject use and local definition. The big 
kind of kicker if you were to use this. I would not advocate for using this if you are in a shared catalog because um, for interchange purposes, documentation of the structure should be provided to exchange partners by the organization initiating the exchange. So basically, um, don't be making your own rules if you're in a shared catalog. And if you do make your own rules, you need to disseminate that information, um, you know, how you're doing it, uh, the scope of what you're doing, uh, and, you know, what terms you're using. That all needs to be documented clearly and shared um, if one was to use the 690 fields. But that is, you know, if you are not in a shared catalog, that could be a way to um, apply terms that are important, informative, practical to your catalog. And these are repeatable again, so you can add at least three. Um, and there's more documentation um, about those fields in the Mark 21 handbook. Any questions so far? I'm happy to take a short break and check in, see how we're see how we're doing. Any questions about controlled vocabulary? Um, feel free to put anything in the chat or hop on. If not, we can move into some of the interesting history that has to do with subject headings. I'm not seeing anything, so I think we're all on board. All right, so potentially people have heard of the Rainbow Roundtable, which is a section of the American Library Association, their social responsibilities roundtables. Um, the, ra the Rainbow Roundtable has changed names over the years. Uh, it was established in 1970 as the Task Force on Gay Liberation. And the reason why I bring this up is because on the left of the screen, we'll see this letter here. This is the ALA's Social Responsibilities Roundtable, which I should have mentioned that was formed um, in 1969. And they sent out this press release that the Task Force on Gay Liberation was formed within this um, section of ALA. And, you know, most importantly to what we're talking about today, the revision of library classification schemes, including subject headings to remove homosexuality from the realm of social aberrations, was one of the founding pillars and reasons why the Rainbow Roundtable, you know, still around today and working, um, one of the main reasons, the pillars of why they were formed was so that subject headings and classification schemes would reflect homosexuality not as deviant um, psychological defects, um, but just a way of being um, and that there was important material that should get accurate subject headings. So a little bit more on this um, task force um, comes into play in, at the 1971 ALA annual meeting in Dallas, Texas. There are a lot of really interesting resources um, and some primary, primary materials around this meeting in particular um, in the cataloging world and in the world of um, LGBTQ liberation, uh, there were some really interesting events that occurred. So the theme of the annual meeting was response to a restive world, which I thought was very interesting and, you know, awfully progressive. Um, and Betty Giddings, who was a member, she's pictured down here on the right, um, kind of the second person in there in the glasses. She said, we had a pair of talks under the charming title, Sex and the Single Cataloger, New Thoughts on Some Unthinkable Subjects, which was about the funny subject headings that gay materials are classified under. Um, Betty Giddings was, and we'll get to her in a minute, um, she was very influential in getting homosexuality out of the DSM um, the psychology book about um, different disorders. Um, and another thing that happened at um, 
this conference in particular was the Hug a Homosexual booth, which there is very interesting um, footage from that and kind of a little bit of pushback and a little bit of acceptance. You know, you see both sides. Um, so that's really interesting that that happened this year. But um, in this presentation, the pair of talks was done by Joan Marshall and Steve Wolf. Their panel was one of the earliest public criticisms of the Library of Congress treatment of gay and lesbian in their subject headings. Um, so there's some really interesting articles, and here's a picture of that booth on the left. Um, just a really interesting kind of culmination of, of different movements and different subject headings. And here's a picture of Barbara Giddings um, before her death. I cannot live without books. Great quote. Um, and another fun fact about the 1971 ALA meeting uh, is that this author here on the left, Alma Routsong, was awarded the first Gay Book Award, which we know today as the Stonewall Book Awards um, for her work, Patience and Sarah, which was credited as Isabel Miller, which was then later republished as a place for us. Um, but they gave out that award for the very first time, and it's still award today. Um, a lot happened in this 1971 uh, ALA meeting. Oh, as I said here, um, Betty Giddings was very uh, informative on getting homosexuality uh, as a mental disorder out of the DSM um, in 1972, therefore, therefore influencing cataloging and classification practices for gay subjects. Um, and then there's also more about the Gay Book Awards and Bib bibliographies it signaled and contributed to an emerging field and the creation of new subjects and classifications firmly placed the growing discipline in the catalog and on the shelves. As I mentioned before, the literary warrant is how, um, you know, new subject headings are justified for inclusion in these controlled vocabularies. So creating an award led to subject headings because the material was then really recognized like hey not only does this book exist not only is this term a term um it's awarded it's a thing it's normalized um so gender and sexuality scholars audiences and librarians demanded that the subject headings be based on their terms rather than those of medical professionals who had historically pathologized homosexuality so a lot happened in the early 70s when it comes to subject headings um, in this particular group. Another person who has been instrumental uh, for this topic in subject headings is Ellen Greenblatt, who passed away two years ago. Um, these are two of her works that have been very um, influential in the library world, not just on subject headings. Um, but there's a little info on her, one of the first co-chairs of the Gay and Lesbian Task Force, which is now known as the Rainbow Roundtable, um, also a member of the Stonewall Book Award Committee, and a member of the Feminist Task Force of the Social Responsibilities Roundtable, which we'll get to them as well. And uh, we will talk about the Homosaurus, uh, which is fairly new, but Ellen Greenblatt was um, an editor and uh, revised that controlled vocabulary, which we will get more into uh, later. I mentioned the Feminist Task Force. This is another task force that fell under that same um, social responsibilities section of ALA. Oh, and it's worth noting that um, the Gay Task Force was the first professional organization in the country um, for. Uh, LGBT people to, um, you know, fight for their protections in the workplace. Um, so that's kind of a fun fact about librarianship and ALA in general. But the Feminist Task Force um, was also formed in 1970. There was the, um, it, it had gone under different names for a while. It was called the Task Force on the Status of Women in Libraries. Women's Liberation Task Force, Status of Women Task Force in 1976. It was the Feminist Task Force, um, which is, I believe, how it's known today. Um, 
1974, they formed a subcommittee that was specifically about sexism in subject headings. Um, they proposed changes to bias-led Library of some Library of Congress subject headings. So this is an example, um, and that would be, you know, women as librarians versus saying women librarians. Um, there are a whole slew of where this particular way of, you know, bias led um, terminology is still present, but a bunch have been updated and changed as well, where it's like women astronauts instead of women as astronauts. Um, they this so this subcommittee about subject headings presented a report to the resources and technical services division of the American Library Association, which is now known as the Association for Library Collections and Technical Services. Um, I think there's more on that. Um, uh, that report potentially in the next slide, um, but then in 1977 and once again, we'll recognize this name, Joan Marshall, one of the presenters from the 1971 um, cataloging panel that was at ALA, um, wrote a book called On Equal Terms, A Thesaurus for Non-Sexist Indexing and Cataloging. I just find it very interesting that um, this revision and caring about specific language has been very present in cataloging and subject headings, you know, since the early 70s. And then uh, in the 1988 uh, Gay Lesbian Task Force Newsletter, Volume 1, Issue 1, they mentioned um, Joan Marshall and Stephen Wolfe. They have essays in the 1972 book, Revolting Librarians. Um, and another persistent and outspoken critic who we'll get to is Sanford Berman. Um, so LC subject headings are used in the catalogs of thousands of libraries throughout the world. And library users looking for gay oriented materials have had difficulty locating them due to the unexpected and sometimes pejorative headings these materials are listed under. Various librarians have have been lobbying Library of Congress for at least 15 years to revise the subject headings used for gay and lesbian oriented materials. Suggestions have been mailed to LC's subject cataloging division, including included in articles appearing in library journals and published in books examining um, the controlled vocabulary. I found that really interesting and it really speaks to, you know, it's about patrons. It's about findability. Um, you don't want to alienate your patrons, and that will come up, you know, uh, in a couple slides here. Some of Library of Congress more objectionable, ex objectionable headings and cross references, for example, homosexuality, see sexual perversion, were changed in 1975 with the eighth edition of its subject heading system. Um, oh, I didn't look up which edition of Library of Congress subject headings were on now, um, but the eighth came out in 1975. So, you know, we're many editions past that, um, but this kind of push and pull of change in terms has been, um, there's a long history of it. And one of those people who are very um, foundational to this is Sanford Berman. A little information about him on the right, um, but in 1971, he published a book called Prejudices and Antipathies, a tract on the LC subject heads concerning people. This is kind of one of the most foundational texts as to um, kind of, let's, let's call it social justice and subject headings. Um, this book was reprinted in 1993 and um, acknowledged some of the updates that have occurred. Um, and it really fought to rid the Library of Congress subject heading of bias, the Christocentric um, perspective that permeates Library of Congress, racially tinged, headings abound, um, reminding the profession of the progress made and the problems that still persist. And it's it's really interesting to look at the 1993 edition and 
go to the Library of Congress subject heading database and see what has changed because there are still changes occurring that were suggested, you know, in 1971. So that's really interesting to see. Um, and Sanford Berman has, you know, worked in West Germany, worked in Zambia, and then also Minnesota. So he's led quite an interesting life um, and he's still with us. So that's very interesting to see. Now, on the flip side of this, um, someone who has been instrumental in controlled vocabulary and the Library of Congress specifically is Barbara Tillett, um, also still with us. And she has many, many awards to her name for her work in um, being on the uh, Joint Steering Committee for the development of RDA. And um, if you were in either the intro class or the advanced class, we know that RDA is what guides us. Um, it tells us what information to include in our MARC records. So massive props there. Um, there's a really interesting interview that I've linked here and added this big quote um, from her about, and it talks about accessibility in terms of using ordinary language for what audience. Um, Library of Congress has children's headings for that audience and otherwise Library of Congress subject headings is targeting the US public and our Congress. We rely on special thesauri for special audiences like the medical subject headings for technical medical language to meet the needs of doctors and others in the medical profession. NASA's thesaurus for aerospace engineers. In demonstrating that a new term is now ordinary language or that an old term is now referred to using a new term in ordinary language, we'd use evidence from the materials we are cataloging. Additionally, we do consult newspapers, the web, respected authority, authoritative sources. This is the back to avoiding ephemeral terminology as main headings, but considering such terms for references. Um, this quote makes me think of the Drabinsky quote um, from the beginning of today's presentation about how not only do controlled vocabulary terms need to represent where we are now, what material is out there, but material to come as well. Um, so it's interesting kind of, you know, push and pull of the time, maybe zeitgeist, um, into what terms are being used and presented in um, controlled vocabularies. Um, so there is a subcommittee um, that I think this is the racism and sexism in subject analysis um, was a subcommittee. They reported uh, to ALA in the 1980s, um, reporting to cataloging and classification section which is now the um, ALCT, which was spelled out on a previous slide. Um, it was directed towards the eradication of sexual and racial bias in bibliographic systems. The subcommittee reports its progress in the identification of areas of classification system and subject headings that are requiring change. A policy statement and six guidelines establish a framework for three categories of projects. So the first um, is the need for changes in Library of Congress subject headings applied to materials on a wide range of racial, ethnic, and lifestyle groups. Two, the analysis of placement and terminology used to classify women and racial and ethnic minorities in both Library of Congress and Dewey schedules. Um, so that's classification number. The compilation of annotated bibliographies citing the research done already in the subject area and terminology relating to women and African Americans. So there's so many different um, histories about specific identities with that have come into play with um, subject headings. So in addition to um, gender, the task force on, on women, um, and sexual orientation, the gay task force work, um, now the Rainbow Roundtable, uh, and this here in the 80s, talking about both um, race and you know, lifestyle groups, um, which I believe encapsulates LGBTQ um, and potentially you know, gender um, identities as well. 
And now something that's happened more recently um, is in 2016, students at Dartmouth's Baker Berry Library, they petitioned to change the subject headings illegal alien to undocumented immigrants and aliens to non-citizens. Um, a really wonderful short documentary called Change the Subject was released in 2019, specifically talking about the experience of these students who petitioned their library, not realizing that the terms that they um, felt alienated and dehumanized by were part of a larger national, really worldwide um, controlled vocabulary, Library of Congress subject headings. They didn't know that they were um, coming up against a much larger system than just what was in their library catalog. It really speaks to the importance of words as a framework for our thinking. Um, and it gets into the very sticky subject of um, neutrality of terms and can a term really be fully neutral? Um, and it and it spoke to the larger process than just one single library applying terms to a subject. Um, so I've included a link on the syllabus, um, which I sent out and is also on Niche Academy. It's, I forget how long, I it might be less than an hour, um, but it's a great watch, really interesting stuff. And very current and relevant. Um, and then last month, um, there was a wonderful journal um, released called First Monday, and it was all about disability and accessibility. Um, and there was a wonderful article in there called Handicapped Has Been Canceled, the Terminology and Logistics of Disability in Cultural Heritage Institutions. And they talk a lot about subject headings um, and how language has changed, maybe how it hasn't. Um, they get into the history of, of different uh, disabilities being represented in different terms. Um, but it, it, you know, ADA was, was passed in 1990 on a national level in Vermont. It was written into um, our law in 1996. Um, and it really comes down to how physically accessible scholarship can be. Um, and it's really guided by this movement of nothing about us without us. So once again, asking that question of whose authority is it that's making these terminologies that we use and then disseminate and perpetuate, um, who's at the table to make that decision? What life experience do they have? Um, so that's a very interesting article that is, you know, from January of this year. So this this kind of interesting conversation around subject headings has really been very present for a long time, um, which is kind of why I wanted to do a presentation about it today. A lot of this conversation comes from critical cataloging movement. Um, there is a larger movement called critical librarianship that really is about asking questions um, like, is cataloging neutral? Can it be neutral? Most critical catalogers will say cataloging is not neutral. And it's important that we say that it's not neutral, that words are not neutral, libraries are not neutral. Um, they have been focused on an intersectional approach to identity and identities and uh, incorporating the community and self-determinism, that kind of bias for us. Um, and expertise led is um, what Sanford Berman was really trying to get at is that it comes down to expertise, lived experience to make decisions and um, really hold authority when it comes to controlled vocabularies. Uh, on social media, you'll often often see the hashtag CritCat. Um, that is a way to follow along different conversations. And on the right here, um, in 2007, Sanford Berman sent um, to the Cataloging Policy and Support Office, which is where, um, uh, I'm now blanking on her name, but uh, the woman who worked at OCL, or worked at Library of Congress, you know, he would go back and forth with her a lot. Um, so she would be receiving this, but it was to 
recommend a new subject heading, which is critical librarianship. So this isn't also a, a new term. Um, it's not a new movement, um, but it's, you know, relatively, relatively um, newer than some of the movements we've been talking about. Um, but it's an interesting thing to check out. Um, and there's critcat.org, which has a lot of resources about that um, movement. So we're going to start talking about some alternatives. Oh, there is a question in the chat, which says, once these subject headings are updated or changed, what is the process for making sure they are reflected in the catalog? That is a great question, Jill. And it's also unfortunately a labor intensive one because we all know that um, our catalogs are not linked directly to these um, controlled vocabularies. It will be a manual change um, for subject headings that get updated. But there is a newsletter that one can subscribe to from the Library of Congress, which gets sent out, I think, maybe every couple of month, months um, with the Library of Congress subject headings that have been updated, um, you know, since their last, since their last um, newsletter. So I wish I could say that they automatically did that and that you wouldn't have to go and do more work, but that is not the way that it works at the moment. Maybe with um, technology and the internet, someday we'll see truly linked vocabulary, which would update automatically, but we are not there. So manual is unfortunately the case. Um, oh, there are more questions. Oh no, what did I do? I minimized something. I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute because I just did something weird. Um, okay, I see that there are other questions in the chat. Let's get to those. All right. So depending on your ILL system, can you perform a global update to change subject headings as well? Andrea asked that. That is a good question. Um, it depends on what ILS you have, your integrated library system, also known as your catalog. Um, there might be some reports that um, you can in yours. That sounds like a wonderful time saver. Um, I would imagine that there would be reports that specifically look out, um, you know, like find and change. Um, yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I don't know. I would imagine that there would be um, reports that may be built in. It's a global update. Cool. Well, that's great. That's the wonders of technology uh, making our lives easier when it works, and we love that. So um, Janet asks, does Clover update subject headings as changed? So my understanding is that Clover pulls in um, the cataloged records from our various um, ILS systems. And so whatever is changed in the catalog will be updated in Clover um, automatically. All right, did I miss a question? No, I don't think so. If I miss anyone's question, please just let me know. Um, some Karen says, I'm doing original cataloging on a book. What is the best process for finding Library of Congress subject headings? Oh. Good question. Um, maybe I didn't spell that out. There is a database. Excuse me. There's a database um, online which is free to use. Um, its interface is maybe a tiny bit dated, um, but once you get the hang of it, it's really helpful one stop shop for name authorities and Library of Congress subject headings. I did put it on the syllabus. I think it's linked within the presentation. Let me just confirm that. Um, on the Library of Congress subject headings page. Yes, authorities.loc.gov. Um, yeah, which I'm happy to chat about how to use that. Um, maybe if there's time, uh, I can maybe demo 
what it's like to use that. I'd be happy to do that. Um, there's another question of does an items mark record get updated as subject headings change? Um, not automatically unless it's like a goal, a global change um, or if it's Clover where it's pulling. Um, yep, April confirmed Clover searches mark records directly from your catalog. So whatever you do to your catalog gets pulls in. Oh, Sarah Rogers put authority.loc.gov into the chat. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, we can we can demonstrate. Yeah, cool. OK, we'll demonstrate. Um, I think I only have four more slides, which will probably get us to 1115 and then we can take the last 15 minutes for any questions um, and a demo. Thanks, guys. I love the feedback. Um, yeah, so what's the best process for finding Library of Congress subject headings? Check the Verso page um, and then we'll look at the website. All right, thanks guys for all the questions. Let's get back into it. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some non-Library of Congress subject headings for a little bit here. So we have the Homosaurus, which is um, for LGBTQ plus vocabulary. It was first created in 1997 for a specific um, Dutch and English gay and lesbian thesaurus for their collections in the Netherlands, um, a specific library um, and archive in the Netherlands came up with this thesaurus. But then in 2013, um, Jack Vanderwell and Ellen Greenblatt, who we talked a little bit about um, earlier, uh, went and revised it. And that created um, kind of version one uh, of the Homosaurus. And version two came out in 2019, which was edited by a whole board of people. Um, and the way that it appears in the catalog, if you were to use it, you would have that second indicator as a seven. And then in subfield two, um, Homo IT is the um, code that you would put in to point to that. And here's um, kind of what it looks like on their website when you're looking for a term. So this is gender neutral language is the term. It has a code um, as well. And this is being you know, currently worked on. Um, it gives you related terms. It gives you a scope note and, and description um, and some alternates um, in where you would replace these with this term. Yeah, um, so that's one example. And there are many other examples pertaining to all different types um, of topics, subjects, identity, um, so the Alaska Native Project was created by the Alaska Native Subject Headings, and that came out last year, um, a grant committee, and you can look at the terms, um, kind of their conventions and their um, way that they went about doing that. Their implementation plan uh, is available at this link. It's really interesting to look at, and it, you know, it's state um, specific, which is really cool. Um, the American Folk Folklore Society Ethnographic Thesaurus was created by the American Folklore Society, um, and their terms can be found here at this link. It's another example. Um, while this resource here is not a specific vocabulary, it is a really great guideline. Um, the Archives for Black Lives in Philadelphia, the Anti-Racist Description Resource. Um, it was created by the Archives for Black Lives in Philadelphia's Anti-Racist Description Working Group. So they created a working group um, and it's a really interesting guideline um, document to think about. And um, the Ways of Knowing Oral History Collection um, is a very interesting collection of interviews that are all audio with um, different creators. Like there is um, 
there's someone from Homo IT. I think there's someone for um, a Spanish language um, controlled vocabulary as well. But there's like four or five different um, examples of these interviews with people talking about the process, the history, um, and what they're doing to make controlled vocabulary more accurate, relevant, um, inclusive. Okay, so we are going to check the chat. Um, if you want an example, says Karen, the book I'm working on is Chris Blackwell's The Islander. Okay, yeah, we can look at um, the subject headings that might be applicable to The Islander, because that's a book that I don't know off the top of my head, um, and we can go through that process. Are there any other questions? Could the links to those projects be shared later on? Yes, um, the slides are going to be on Niche Academy. I think they're already there, um, but uh, I'll also resend them out with a follow-up email. Um, and I believe most of them are linked as well in the syllabus document um, that's on Niche Academy, and I'll send that out as well. So multiple ways to um, get those links. They are active as the PDF version, says Laura. OK, so I think the PDF is what is on Niche Academy. Um, but if anyone comes across any trouble with those, um, just send me an email. So Jeanette asks, for 650, can you add any subdivision to any authorized heading, like fiction to any heading? Yes, um, those subfields aren't um, necessarily uh, restricted. Like if you if you have, I don't know, fiction about um, rum smugglers in Vermont, you can you can go ahead and add a Z subfield and say Vermont. That um, there's nothing. I don't think there's really too much um, specificity when it comes to those subfields, or at least not as much um, as with the the A field. It it really um, depends on what the item is too. All right, so I think we're caught up on those questions. Feel free to jump in if you need to. Um, I think I wanted to put a plug in for the upcoming next Wednesday, our last session throughout cataloging month, which once again, thank you for joining me. Um, next week, we're gonna be talking about cataloging non-traditional materials. So Library of Things, how do I catalog this? Please bring examples um, and we'll discuss some best practices, some important mark fields to get right, um, that kind of stuff. And that'll be the last like session, but um, on Tuesday the 28th, which is the last Tuesday, um, we'll be having the Vermont Cataloging Roundtable, which is basically just an opportunity to ask questions, share concerns, cataloging conundrums, but also successes. Um, we may use different ILS, but we can still share what's happening in the VT cataloging community. That's kind of my tagline for that. Um, so that'll just be another you know, opportunity for resource sharing, get together, talk about cataloging. Um, all right, that's my little hey thanks. But let's move into a demo of the Library of Congress subject headings. Let me get this uh, sorted out. OK. Yeah, and if people don't want to stay for the demo, feel free to log off. Um, but otherwise, let's go to Every time I open a new thing, it changes my screens. Here we go. OK, so I have, as you can see, a lot of bookmarks up here, but I always have LOC authorities um, at the top of my screen. And I'm going to copy this and I'll put it in the chat if you feel like following along. Um, so our, if I had a book in my hand, Chris Blackwell's The Islander, what I would do first, honestly, if I was trying to think of what subjects to use, I would go on to Goodreads. 
and I would search for the book, The Islander, My Life in Music and Beyond. Oh, interesting. This is nonfiction. This is an autobiography. This is a biography. This is a memoir. Um, okay, so memoir. Let's see what we got there. So I'm just going in search authorities. Here we go. This is the main landing page. We have subject authority headings. You need to specify whether you're looking for a subject or if you're looking for a name authority. Those are really the two um, most helpful uh, term results that you can get from uh, this database. So I'm just going to put, no, I'm not going to put in that. I'm going to put in, uh, let's see what comes up for memoir. It might require me to say memoirs plural. OK. Over here, it's going to show us the type of heading. These are all Library of Congress subject headings. That's great. That's what we want. But all of these have specifications that don't really apply. So let me scroll down. You're going to get a lot of results. And you may need to click through some things. But I'm not seeing what I want immediately, so I'm going to go back. I'm going to try memoirs because it may make a difference. Right again, memoirs. Oh, it's a reference in the Library of Congress subject headings. So let's click on references. Oh gosh, I clicked too many times. OK, so nope. Sorry, I clicked too many times. References for memoirs. It's this page here, information for memoirs. Source of heading is Library of Congress catalog, which is what we want. Um, select a link to look for the following. So this will take us to the authority record. There is no authority record for memoirs. So let's go back to this view. It's redirecting us to autobiography, biography, also see this example. I don't really care to see the example, but let's go with autobiography. OK, it's going to take me back to this here. This Library of, Sub Library of Congress subject headings is what we still are after. Authorized and references. That's always a good sign because this means that there is an authorized record authority record. That's what we want to see. And there's also some narrower terms. Interesting. Captivity narratives, slave narratives. That's like really specific about autobiographies. But for whatever reason, it's linked to those. So we just keep clicking until we land on a page like this. This is the mark display, which might be a little confusing. Let's look at the labeled display first up at the top. OK. Topical subject heading. This is what's going to go in your A subfield. Autobiography. Now, maybe this wasn't the strongest example because when it comes to subject headings, it's not um, describing the object itself. It's describing what the object is about. And if the book doesn't reference an autobiography, it probably shouldn't be in the 650 field. It should be in the 655 field for uh, form, but we, we've gotten this far under that conception, but I just wanted to note that. Um, so if you look at the mark display in 100 or in 150 in this case, this is where it's showing you um, how it should appear. And It'll show you the related terms down here, history and criticism of autobiographies. So once again, because we're talking about 650 fields, it's the subject, what the material is addressing, which, you know, in this case, the Islander uh, is probably not going to be actually addressing autobiographies. So that was a misstep uh, in my in my search, really. Um, so let's try a different search. Let's just do music. Let's see what comes up. Music. Okay, 
easy enough. Authorized with references and notes. Music, it's a Library of Congress subject heading. Basically, when I'm using this um, database, if there's a button that says all of these things are present, it's probably worth clicking on. Now, if you are looking for multiple subject headings, this landing page before you get to the authority record can be really helpful by saying, oh, art and music is a narrower term, which means that it's its own subject heading. So in this one search for music, I've now gotten two subject headings that I could use on the material because it probably addresses art and music. Once again, I might need to read the summary. I might need to maybe look at the table of contents or flip through the book, look at the index to see if these subjects are really present. Um, but subject headings should refer to 20% of the material. So if it's re represented in the in the book, at least 20% or so of the of the topic. How am I? How am I? to put that better. Um, if it's 20% of the topic of the book, it can go as a subject heading, at least 20%. Does that make sense? So if, if music shows up in 20% of the object, which can take a little bit of time to decipher whether that's true or not for the item, um, it can go as a subject heading. So here's this in 130 music, I don't know why it has two hyphens. Let's go to the labeled display. Sometimes it's a little easier to see. Uniform title heading, music. Uniform title heading. We want the subject heading. Oh, field, heading, heading. There's two of them. Let's go on the second one. There we go. This is the heading that we want. We want it to say music. Let's look at the labeled display. Music, topical subject heading, perfect. We can put music in 650. The first indicator is probably gonna be blank um, unless you know how much of it really does show up. Um, that second indicator is gonna be a zero because we're using the Library of Congress subject heading. Um, subfield A is gonna be music. Now in subfield V, you could put autobiographies. That would be fine uh, in that V um, form of the thing. Uh, and as I mentioned on this page, let's look at art and music. Art and music is also a heading. So there you go. There's two subject headings that probably go into this. Um, I don't know that much about this man. He founded Island Records. It's probably less art and just music. But I wonder if there's anything um, about music industry. Industry. And we're on subject authority because we wanna do that. Oh, it is a reference. I'm gonna click on this one down here because it has the Library of Congress subject headings. We're searching in references, music trade. Weird. Music publishing, music supervision, sound recording industry. Okay, there we go. So we know that this man founded um, a label, Island Records. We could do sound recording industry. It'll take us back to this results page, but we see over here, Library of Congress subject headings. It's got this lovely button. Once again, related things, but let's go on to the authority record. It's going to list us these again. Sound recording industry. Let's look at the label display for ease. Boom, there is the topical subject heading sound recording industry. That is applicable to this item. Now I'm doing this without the physical item in hand. It would be a little bit easier with the physical item because you have you know multiple places to look, um, but it's doable. And um, down here in this 150 is where it's showing us this is how it should be displayed. 
Okay. Since this is up, um, I also just want to show the name authority and how that works because it's a little different. Um, let's just make it Vermont specific. Oh, did I misspell Madeline? Let's find out. Uh, yeah, it seems like I did. Let's do a different thing that I know how to spell. Let's search for Bernie. Let's see. Personal name. That's what we're looking for. It's a reference. Let's look. Oh, it's Bernard. Silly me. Of course it's Bernard. So let's keep clicking. I wonder if it'll give years. Okay, this is a lot of information. Let's go to the label display so it's perhaps a little bit clearer. Personal name, Bernard Sanders. A variant that is covered by this term is Sanders Bernard. And notice when I initially searched, I did need to put the um, last name, first name. That is part of the name authority. All right, I was hoping to get someone with um, dates. Let's see what comes up for Mark Twain in the name authority because he has a complicated name. Okay, you can also see in this bib records that there are a lot of bib records that use this, which is a good sign. Over here, it's personal name. Let's click on that. Wow, we get a lot of C also. But let's keep continuing with this heading. Label display. Personal heading, he does have dates associated with his name. Now, if you weren't sure how to include that on the record, in the mark display, if you scroll down to 100, it's going to show you exactly, including indicators, what to add to your record. So we got subfield D is where these appear, and subfield A is where his name is. Um, one, which I believe is about added entry, um, and it goes in the 100 field. So this counts as both a 600 if there was a book where he was the subject or if he was the author. All right, I wanted to show that since that was up. All right, do we have more questions? We have like 12 minutes. Um, I'm happy to stop talking or I'm happy to answer more questions or show more examples. Um, let me know how everyone's doing out there in Teams Circle world. I should get this recording up um, this afternoon. OK, could you show another example and go through the rec heading record more? Yeah. All right, let's pull this back up. We go. My example is a memoir of someone with bipolar disorder. Okay, yeah. So let's, I'm just going to copy bipolar disorder into Library of Congress search authorities, and we want this as the subject. I'm going to type it in just as I think it would show up. Okay, so from this main. Yep, feed me Erica Nichols Fraser. I, yep, we just got that book uh, at the state. So the Library of Congress subject heading is presented here. Bipolar disorder. Um, notice that uh, there's also medical subject headings. And as you can see, it's very similar. Um, the D is capitalized, but let's go with the Library of Congress subject headings button. Um, it's showing you an example here, but let's go to the authority record, the authority record. Okay. So in the mark area, there's a lot. Your 450s are going to be related terms. Um, but your 
main entry here is going to be you know either marked 100 or 150 that can just go in your 650 field um, bipolar disorder if you wanted to add um i don't think they have examples necessarily um, but if you wanted to add in the case of feed me which i do know this book already but for our sake i'm going to pull it up and i'm going to go into goodreads and i'm going to pull it up just as more reference okay so this is a really new book and it doesn't have user generated tags yet which is what i was hoping for because that uh you know serves as a good jumping off point a lot of times but you can also read the summary here, which is great. Um, undiagnosed bipolar. Um, let's see what else would be good. Well, I, I happen to know that it is an autobiography. So if I were to put in the A field bipolar disorder, I could then put in the V field autobiography so that both of those aspects of the book come up with that term but you can always and this is where it's a judgment call you can and knowing how your ILS works um, in terms of searching and indexing um, you can keep it as broad as solely 650a bipolar uh, disorder or you could have 650a bipolar disorder uh, z for Vermont or um, and or uh, v autobiographies so it's a little bit of a choose your own adventure how much time uh how does your ils work what is easiest to search what do you think your users will be after um and even if a term isn't necessarily one that your users are going to use um, if it's part of a controlled vocabulary it's good to use because that way when you're in the catalog or in your OPAC um, all of the material with the same terms will be linked together so that's also maybe another reason why you should think about if you want to leave it a little more broad because that way um, everything with the exact same 650 is going to come up when you click on that one 650 field that is usually linked in your ILS. Does that make sense? Karen has a question that says, what would be the easiest way for a soloish librarian to identify subject headings that need to be made more current and relevant? That is a really great question can of worms. I'm thinking specifically terms that are now considered racist, but I know I have many topics to update. For example, I had someone ask for how they could find books supporting Black Lives Matter. That is a good question. Um, yeah, I wish that there was a way that was not time consuming. Um, to be a good question for the round table as well I think um, yeah identify subject headings that need to be more current and relevant um, it's hard because I don't want to I don't want to say you should flood your inbox with the email newsletters from Library of Congress um, especially being a solo librarian and um it's it's hard because you might end up making more work for yourself if you do identify a term that has been um updated but it's also probably worth it if your users are looking and if the term could hold a certain connotation that doesn't sit right with the user that's a big consideration. Um, so there's not, I don't have a straightforward answer. Um, but if you're all right with it, Karen, I might copy that and put it into something to bring up at the round table. 
get a little bit of different brains working together on that kind of question. Um, yeah, I wish that there was like an easy practical, you do this, but um, I'm, yeah. I mean, it's hard to stay on top of changing terminology, <laughs> especially if you're a solo librarian and I recognize that fully. Um, so, but, you know, it, it does come down to how your user is going to interact with the material because that's really what we're after with cataloging. So it's a good question to ponder. Um, yeah, Victoria is echoing. So that would be interesting to hear about. So yeah, let me let me copy that and um, might bring it to the round table. We can discuss, you know, trying to juggle the time management and the specifics of, you know, that's sometimes also why using broader terms and knowing that your catalog is using broader terms um, uh, to encapsulate specific topics. Um, so knowing your catalog is, is really important in this situation and knowing the scope of what terms you put in and if you're putting in, oh, I'm still sharing, um, if you're putting in super broad terms, it might be easier and may lead to less management down the road, um, but it, you know, it can really go either way. Um, Marie also says that looks like bipolar disorder, the subject he heading was changed in 2022, which is interesting for manic depressive. Yeah, these are alive and current, ever changing things. Um, yeah, really interesting to see, you know, the legacy and, and changes that have happened. So Marie also points out that Vocal has a cataloging committee. Wonder if a representative from that and any other consortia reps can be specifically invited to the roundtable for that discussion. Yeah, that would be really great. I would, I really want um, the cataloging roundtable to be a place where, you know, different consortiums are letting everyone else know how they're dealing with different um, stipulations and, and formatting and all those kind of things. That is something that that I hope um, will happen at, at the round table, those kind of discussions. And Janet has asked, how would you use the 450s in the authority record when building 650s in bib records? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for the most part, I kind of ignore everything below what is, what's in that 150 or 100 because um, on the previous page, it shows um, the different related terms. That's the way that I um, uh, usually use the database is that I don't really look at the 650s or the, excuse me, the 450s in that um, database. So that's kind of my quick answer. Um, but I think the 450s are either the terms that the one in the 100 has replaced or they are related terms that could be used but i don't think they are i think it's the first situation it must say in the handbook um yeah i think it's what they have replaced so i kind of ignore them Joss has just a comment, one of gratitude, one that it's heartening to know that librarians have been at the forefront of positive social change. It's also an important reminder of how important language is generally. Yes, I totally agree that. And as I was preparing for this week, I was like a little nervous because I was like, you know, I'm, I'm not here to endorse anything, but there is a lot of interesting history um, and librarians, you know, doing this kind of research and preparation has been very interesting to me. Um, it makes me grateful for our field. It is 1130. With that, we're out of time. Um, but thank you everyone for putting in your questions. Um, and I hope that uh, we can have more discussions. Um, we can do next week, which is all about non-traditional materials, um, kits and things of that nature. So 
thank you guys. Um, everyone, have a great rest of the day. I will be putting this up on Niche Academy. Thanks.